Yesterday, I'm on the plane. And when you're on a plane, there's one thing that always happens. The thing that always happens is the guy or girl that sat next to you decides to want to know your life story, right? This is what happens. So I'm sat, 1D is the seat. And I'm sat in the seat, guy next to me says, oh, what brings you to Ireland? I think, well, hopefully this aeroplane was the first thought. But then the second thought on from there is like I'm telling them what's going on. So I tell them I'm meeting my friends this afternoon. I'm going along to meet my friends, James and Neve, and we're going to go to the Guinness factory. And I'm going to get to pour my own pint, the perfect pint. Everything's going to be beautiful. He says, wow. He says, are you going to the game tonight? I says, no, not for me, thanks. He says, so what really brings you in? Is it just the Guinness? I said, kind of. But then I've got this piece of work to do tomorrow. He says, what do you do for work? I says, well, I've got to deliver a show. I'm delivering a presentation to a room full of business owners, putting on a speech. He says, oh. Speaking in front of audiences, that's cool. I said, yeah, it's real cool. He says, do you not get nervous? I says, of course I get nervous. I get real nervous. And the best thing you can do with those nerves is channel them in some way to be able to express the best way you possibly can because nerves show you care. He says, I never looked at it like that. So I continue to go on and talk to the guy. He says, I was thinking about this speech you have tomorrow. And I thought I'd share with you something that really helped me to overcome my nerves. And isn't it brilliant that people that know nothing about what you do choose to start giving you advice about the thing that you do? (laughs) So here's this guy chirping into his advice that's gonna help me today with my nerves, and he says this. He says, Phil, when I had to do a speech at school, bear in mind I'm speaking to a guy in his early 60s, he says, I got this piece of advice, something that really helped me with my nerves. And what it was is, um, to take a second before you speak and do this. He says, to imagine the audience is naked. (laughs) This happened yesterday. So guys, grab the lights up a second. (laughs) Because I'm liking to listen to people's advice to see if this is going to help me in any way. And I'm sat here looking out at you guys right now and I cannot fathom for one second how that could possibly help me in any way, shape or form. So I think I should probably stick to what I normally do. But the nice thing about yesterday was the fact that I did get to go to see the Guinness factory. I did get to pour myself a perfect pint. I did have a great time getting to explore Dublin. And it isn't always like that, though. I do get the privilege of being able to speak all around the world. I get the privilege to go to some of the best locations. Yet quite often when I get to go to a new location, my host wants to show me the best of the best of the best of what that location has to offer. And here I am in Birmingham, in Alabama, And my host chooses to show me the best of the best of the best of that location has to offer. And ladies and gents, they took me to a baseball game. I need to let you into a secret. That is two hours of my life I cannot get back. (laughs) Nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. In fact, the most excited anybody got at any point during that two-hour session is when two people in the audience were caught kissing. And they put it up on the big screen and they stuck a giant heart around it. That was as good as it got. I quickly realized that that was nothing more than a spectator sport, very little participation from the audience. Thinking about that running into today's session, you get a choice. You get a choice to say that you could sit back for the next hour and 50 minutes, spectate, maybe laugh at a couple of jokes, enjoy the ride. Or you could choose to participate. I'm 100% certain that should you choose to participate in this session, you'll get tons from it. If you choose to spectate, you'll go back home this evening, you'll enjoy your day, you'll get back in your normal routine, and tomorrow nothing changes. Let me give you a little indication of what participation means from my point of view, because I am going to ask you to play full on. I should probably set some rules. First rule would be is if I ask a question, damn, I'd love an answer. It helps. Sometimes I might just want a yes or a no answer. Help me out, guys. I can just about make out the faces. This means yes. And the shake, I know what that one means too. I might ask for times there to be a hand up. And guys, this is a hand up. This is kind of half a hand. And anything lower means you're probably wondering what's for tea this evening. So guys, I do need you to participate full on. One more thing when it comes to participation. Who has a mobile phone with them today? Hey, we got the hands thing. 
Do me yourself and everybody else a favor. Right now, number one, you are welcome to use it to take photos of me. That is the only purpose. Should you do so, I'm at Phil M. Jones UK. You can tag me, you can hashtag, you can do all of those things, and I will join the conversation. But outside of that, please put it out of sight. Please. What I'm looking for you to do during this session isn't necessarily to take notes, but definitely to take notice. And I am going to throw information at you that's going to be something like drinking water from a fire hose. Expect to drop most of it. Expect that to happen. But make sure just the couple of bits that you choose to capture are things that you are going to use. Anybody heard that old saying, knowledge is power? Is that one true, yes or no? No, it's nonsense. Utter nonsense is what knowledge is power is that statement. I don't know why people say it. You can have all of the knowledge in the land. If you fail to apply it, you're no more useful than an encyclopedia on a shelf. It is the implementation, the application of the knowledge that will lead to the power. That's going to be the key difference. Guys, we're also going to talk a little bit about sales today. How many of you in this room, when you introduce yourself to a stranger, would class yourself as a salesperson? They say, what do you do? You say, I work in sales. Hmm, I kind of figured that was the case. Even when I suggested the idea might be true, I saw some of you kind of, like this cold spell came over you as a shudder. Have a think for me for a second, just about some adjectives. Maybe some adjectives that would describe a stereotypical salesperson. So I hear the word pushy. What else could it be? Aggressive. And what about that picture you see in your mind right now? That clear picture that you see of a stereotypical salesperson. Nice picture or ugly picture? Ugly picture. See the word. See the image. If somebody used those words to describe you, how would you guys feel? Ugh. What if I change just one word? I don't ask you to describe a stereotypical salesperson, but a professional salesperson. What changes in the image? What words change in your mind? See, I change one word, you change them all. Everything changes. The picture is remarkably different. Why? Because you're looking at it from a slightly different angle. But this isn't selling, is it, guys? It's not selling. Definitely not selling. Not selling at all. No, guys, no, no, there's no selling involved. Nothing. No selling whatsoever. No, we're not selling, we're recommending. And we're proud members of the Direct Sales Association. Hmm. See, I don't think being a salesperson is a bad thing. I think some of your perception of what a salesperson is, is the bad thing. I promise you this from the kickoff of my presentation, if anybody, particularly a consumer or potential team member, ever says the words to you that you are a great salesperson, it is definitely not a compliment. It simply means you've been caught trying to sell something to somebody. The true goal that you're looking for isn't the applause for your sales skills, it is the receipt of the words, thank you. That's the success we're looking for. Customers saying thank you to us more often. Team members saying thank you to us more often for encouraging us to make a decision, for getting us to join the business. Did any of you not join this business the first time you're offered? First time you're offered this business, you didn't join. And now you wish you did. What would have happened if you met somebody who had a little bit more influence, a little bit more charisma, a little more persuasion to get you to agree to take an action a few months earlier? Would that have been a good thing for you? if you chose to join earlier. Remember what this means. It would make a big, big difference. So we're gonna explore some sales skills, we're gonna explore some life skills, we're gonna explore a number of things that allow you to get a tinsy bit better. Because chances are, if you get a tinsy bit better and you continually do that each and every day, then years start to become great years. Little, tiny things differently. Some of you are probably still wondering who on earth is this guy? I should probably introduce myself. My name is Phil Jones, and I've been in business for quite some time. See, I started in business when I was just 14 years of age. Yes, that is me. And my first business had me just knocking on the doors of my neighbors, asking them quite politely whether they would be interested in having their cars washed. 
Some said yes and a few said no, but most just asked me how much I would charge, which I very quickly realized meant they were remarkably interested, providing my prices were kind of reasonable. And I did okay with my little car cleaning business. So much so that by the age of 15, I wasn't going to school anywhere near as often as I should. I remember being invited in by my school teachers, questioning my attendance, saying, Phil, why aren't you coming to class? I said, sir, do you mind me asking you a question? He said, sure, what is it? I said, how much money are you making? <laughs> sir. <laughs> and I grinned kind of like that too. See, he refused to tell me at the time, but at 15 years of age, my little car cleaning business was delivering me around 2,500 pounds a month. So the reason I wasn't going to school was I had customers that needed taken care of and staff that needed direction. He didn't seem to get it. <laughs> but I continued to work on my education and my studies part-time around my business interests. <laughs> Built a few little entre entrepreneurial businesses through my teens, but at the age of 18, I had a dilemma. I had an offer on the table for one of the most prestigious universities in the UK. Parents wanted me to go get one of those pieces of paper for the wall. You know the piece of paper that makes them feel like they did a great job? <laughs> they wanted me to get one of them. I didn't want to go. I wanted to get my education in the field. I said, hey, mom, how would you feel if I went and got a big job, the kind of big job you could only get with a good degree? Would that make you proud? She said it couldn't be done. Three weeks later, I proved her wrong. I became the youngest ever sales manager for a business called Debenhams Department Stores. You've probably heard of it. And there's a beautiful thing about being in a senior leadership position at the age of 18. Because at the age of 18, you just do not know what you do not know. <laughs> so you do the things you're told to do, and bosses are mesmerized by my results. They say, Phil, how do you do it? This is pretty straightforward, boss. We do the basics to a high standard consistently. They said, is there anything else to it? I said, not really. I continued to do that through multiple stores, got great results everywhere we went. I wanted a promotion. They didn't want to give it to me. You know when you hit those glass ceilings in the corporate ladder? Anybody experienced that? Where the only way that you can get the next job is if the person above you leaves or dies. This guy was in great shape. <laughs> Realizing it was time for a change, I got a phone call from a guy called Lord Graham Kirkham. Lord Kirkham owned the largest independent furniture business in the UK, and my job that he presented me with was to fix broken stores. Stores that used to turn over 7 million had dropped up to like, well, had, uh, used to turn over 10, had dropped back to 7. What I had to do was to turn them around quick. And everywhere we went, we did it. Six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, back to hitting heyday figures. And bosses would say, Phil, how do you do it? I said, it's simple. We do the basics to a high standard, consistently. They said, is there anything else? I said, maybe a few sprinkles of magic. They said, what's all that stuff? Can you please write it down? And it was at that point that I caught my passion for training. I very quickly realized that I got far more personal satisfaction, seeing huge success through other people than I could ever get just achieving stuff by myself. I wrote a huge number of the training principles and processes, still used in that business today, but then, guys, I got sick. I got sick of working every Saturday. Every Sunday, every public holiday, working a 14 day straight following Christmas, about 100 hours a week. In fact, the only people that I saw that I cared about were my customers. That was a problem to me. And it coincided with a phone call I got from a lady called Karen Brady. Karen Brady was the chief executive officer of Birmingham City Football Club, but not only that, was the face of the television show, The Apprentice. You get a call like that, you pay attention got offered the role of head of retail at Birmingham City Football Club. My time there, I trebled the size of the retail operation, secured the largest shirt sponsorship deal the club had ever had. Did the same working with Milan Mandaric at Leicester City Football Club in just three months. Then went on to build a property business with a business partner of mine that turned over 240 million pounds at its peak. On a sales team of five. And then the world changed a little in 2008. Anybody remember? I had a business that was great on a Monday, yet by the Friday we had a product we couldn't give away. The walls caved in. Everything went wrong. We tried to keep it running for 18 months. We did everything we can. I had an 80,000 pounds a month overhead and no income. You go backwards pretty quick. 
And we tried to be able to keep it up, but we decided to bring it down ethically, owing nobody a penny. And then I'm looking in the marketplace saying, what do I do? I see a world full of recession, people miserable, moaning, wondering how they can make a change. Yet I also see something different. What I was seeing was thousands of people doing something that makes a real difference in society or doing something they're really good at or doing something that could make a real change. Yet not one of them was getting anywhere near the success they were capable of. Why? Because they didn't know how to sell stuff. They didn't know how to transact. They didn't know how to influence decision. They didn't know how to make stuff happen or build something out of nothing. And this is the stuff I knew. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I start a little training business that does nothing other than deliver essential sales skills to non-salespeople? That's where my business started in 2008. Since that point in time, now over 2 million people have been through my programs. My business is a little bit different now. Four best-selling books. In fact, it's now 56 countries, five continents. Got 26 franchisees globally that teach my stuff. Yet still my work to me is really simple. I only know how to do three things. There are only three things I'm any good at. One is how to find more customers. Two is how to get them to come back more often. And three is how to get them to spend more money when they shop. It's the only stuff I know about. And it's allowed me to be able to travel the world, live in the house of my dreams, live with a girl that lights up my world. Like literally, I get to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, just because I've learned some simple skills. I've also learned a little bit about your business. Since 2009, I've been a huge friend of forever. I've worked with some of the business's finest of leaders, but not when they were the finest of leaders, when they were brand new. When they were like many of you guys in this room, thinking, hey, hey, I've got a dream, and I've got a hope, and I've got an opportunity, and I want to make it count. And I've seen what it takes. Today, I've worked now with 6,432 independent FBOs all around the world, helping them find their version of success for themselves. And how have we done it? Through helping you with some of the missing ingredients. What you have is a winning attitude. I know that. That's why you're here. What you have is the belief that more can be possible. That's why you're here. What many of you are missing, though, is something really simple. It's just some skills. Because many of you haven't learned just some of the simple things that you can do differently. And it's the skills that are standing in your way. Have you ever found yourself with a perfect opportunity in front of you and you just haven't known what to do with it? You're like... It's always tomorrow. Tomorrow's good. We've been there, haven't we? So right now, I want to give you some skills. I want to help you overcome some of the obstacles. Maybe get you to think a little bit differently, move a bit differently, but you have to promise me you're going to play full on. Guys, can you commit you're going to play full on with me? Yes or yes? yes. Nice choice. Now, I was asked to say, can I help you get back to basics? And then I'm thinking about this idea of getting back to basics and think it's a stupid idea because you weren't doing them in the first place. How can you get back to them? Wouldn't it make more sense if we move forward to basics? And whatever it is, is something that we are looking to move forward to. I heard one of the speakers earlier on that said we all need something to chase. See, if our future is already in our past, it's pretty crappy, isn't it? Wouldn't we rather that our future was brighter and that we had something to be able to run towards? And there's nothing basic about the basics. The basics are remarkably sexy when done well. And we have to think about what our basics really lead to in this kind of business. We have to think about what our first things are that we would need to be able to do. We have to think about what really leads towards success. And I thought I'd start by giving you the big secret. Who wants the big secret? This is the big secret to success. It's the number one secret. It's the one thing that most people don't know. And I should probably whisper it. Because if I whisper it, then that makes it okay. And you won't tell anybody. Here's the big reason. Why most people fail to get any success is because they don't believe it's possible. Shh, don't tell anybody else. That's why. No joke, guys. Most people just categorically fail to think big enough for what their success could mean to them. They think success is for other people. They look at other people, they go, wow, look at them, they're brilliant. 
I can't be that brilliant. Guys, you have to set yourself free. You have to understand that big is possible. There's a mistake that happens. It happens in nearly every business in the whole of the land. And it's a mistake that I see time and time again. I get invited to conferences. And what happens is people get invited on stage at conferences. You guys got invited on stage. In fact, I'm going to do it from this side of the stage over here because this is the side that many came on from. I get invited to conferences. People do brilliant in the business. And what happens is they've achieved such great success And they get invited onto the stage all nervous. And as they get nervous, the nerves come away. And then as they step towards the stage, they find this new walk. (laughs) I even saw James do it earlier when he was standing up on stage. And somebody was in front of him. And he saw like the the, the picture. And he's like, (laughs) I saw it. Don't deny it. Definitely saw it. See, we find this new level of success. We think we've done brilliantly. We're up on stage. We think everything is wonderful. And I'm not saying the recognition is not a good thing. But I find myself at these events when people get invited up on stage. And then I get invited to go and have lunch with them or dinner with them or drinks with them after the event. And I'm at an event in Atlanta in Georgia. Get invited to this group of people's luncheons afterwards. They all got put up on stage. They were feeling brilliant. And as I get invited into the luncheon with them, I thought I'm going to ask them a few questions. The first question I asked them, how does it feel then to be part of the Just Above Average Club? They said back to me, no, Phil, that's not what this is. This is the elite group of professional people. We're not. That's not what it's called. I said, I've looked at the stats. I've looked at what it takes to get into this club. And you, my friends, are proud members of the Just Above Average Club. You want to see their faces. I said, really? I said, guys, you are parading around like you've achieved some form of minor miracle. I said, I'd like you just to maybe understand where this sits in the whole grand scheme of life in terms of the things that you could be shooting for. Just imagine a slightly different set of circumstances in your life. Slightly different. Say, for example, you've just been out on a romantic meal with a loved one. And let's say that it's gone remarkably well. So well that it results in them coming back to your home. Not just coming back to your home, but a particular room in your home. They come back to your bedroom. Following which is a night of wild, passionate lovemaking. And then a question is asked. How was it for you, dear? (laughs) And the response comes as just above average. How happy and content would you be with a description of your performance in that environment? (laughs) And the question I ask of you guys is, if less than satisfied there, why are we so satisfied in our business marketplace when we see statistics and we see measures and we see leak tables and we think, yeah, I'm there or thereabouts, cha-ching. There or thereabouts is not the thing that we should be shooting for. If you do nothing else from today's session, please do this as a minimum. Raise the bar. Think a little bit bigger, reach a little bit higher, stretch the thing out a touch. You're all going to realize something. That the more successful you become, the more phone calls you receive asking to borrow money. (laughs) This happens. And I'm going to use this to be able to explain to you why most people fail to think big. About six weeks ago, I get an inbound phone call, one of these phone calls. My younger brother calls me, says, hey, Phil, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. He says, how about you? He says, oh, not so good. I know where this is going. I say, what's up then, kid? He says, you know, things are going good with the business. I'm doing great. I've just been waiting for this check to be able to clear, and this happened, and that happened. I said, Tim, what do you need? He says, any chance I can borrow 500? He says, what for? He says, my rent is due. Now, I've got a difficulty with this because he's asked me this same question three times in the last 12 months. So there's something that isn't fixed in here. I says, Tim, there must be a better way. There must be a way we can think around this. There must be something you can do because if I lend you the money, you have to give it to me back. It doesn't mean the problem goes away. We just push it away for another day. Still need to fix this. He says, yeah, but I've got no ideas. I said, Tim, you must better do something in your business to generate an extra 500 quid. He says, no, I've got no ideas that can generate me 500 pounds. I said, boom. There's your problem. Why are you trying to find a 500 pound idea to fix a 500 pound problem? I says, here's what you need to do. Go away for the next 45 minutes. I want you to come up with as many ideas as you possibly can to make an extra 5,000 pounds. 
That's what I need you to do. Give me ideas that if your life depended on it, what would you do to make 5,000 pounds in the time that you have between now and your rent is due? He says, yeah, but I only need 500. He says, you're missing the point, kid. What I need you to do is not to execute a beautiful 500 pounds idea. I need you to reach at a 5,000 pound idea, give it everything you've got and mess it up. And the result of you messing up, applying yourself to the 5,000 pounds idea is you might make more than 500 quid. So many people are scared of doing it wrong that they're very afraid to try. I wonder how many of you in this business here think, well, I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to mess it up at all. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to go out and get it right first time because these are people I don't want to waste my prospects. How many people in this country? How many million? Five, six million, I mean, who's counting? I mean, how big is your opportunity? How many people in this world can you mess it up with? What happens is the time will pass regardless, but your success will be the compounded effect of the number of times that you mess it up, leaving behind a handful of successes on the way. So I want you all to reach a little bit bigger. Think that more is possible. Reach right out are there for the top. And one thing I want you to focus your mind on right now is four case credits. I've been around this business long enough to hear those words long enough to have you shooting for a number that for so many of you can become quite a challenge. It's about 1,000 euros in retail sales. About 1,000 euros. And I meet people who say that they find it difficult to sell more than 1,000 euros in retail sales and want to earn more than 1,000 euros a month. It's a problem, isn't it? It just doesn't add up. But I'm 100% certain that if you ask yourself, can somebody else do it, and the answer is yes, then somebody else can be you. Then you can go and make it happen. And if you're failing to make it happen with what you have in front of you right now, what's probably missing is some skills. And if it's not some skills, it's a change of attitude. Let's lean on that a little bit more. But do yourself a huge favor. Just shoot a little bit higher and be prepared to miss. So we're talking about dreaming big. Some of you right now probably have some lofty goals. You probably have some goals that say you want to run out and get some more new business, right? You want more new customers. Who wants more new customers? More new team members? How many more new team members do you want? That's the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. This is the answer everybody gives me. They say they want unlimited. They want lots. I want all of them. Hands up right now who's got a team member they wish they didn't have. (laughs) Customer they wish they didn't have. So you don't want all of them, do you? You don't want as many as you can get. There's a huge difference between sales and marketing. What marketeers look to be able to do is to get bees around a honeypot. They say the honey is so sweet, and then the bees turn up, all of them. And then they do the best they can to do something with those that turn up. Salespeople, by alternative, what they do is they choose their customers. They choose their team members. Do you guys know that you have the right to choose the people you'd like to work with? You don't have to work with everybody. You can choose. So if you'd like more new customers, there's a couple of things you need to do. Firstly, you need to decide who it is exactly that you're looking to be able to work with. Hands up in this room who's got kids or has been a kid. (laughs) I'd like you to imagine a little situation. You're in a shopping center. You're in a shopping center, you're looking around, and you see something you quite like. You've got a couple of kids in tow with you. As you're wandering around the little shopping center, you see the thing you quite like, you walk towards the thing, and as you walk towards the thing, you realize you like it a little more than you thought you would. As you pick the thing up to take a closer look, you turn around for the opinion of the children, and in that given moment, the kids are gone. See, for most of you in this room, it would be devastation and despair, for one, and I heard you. (laughs) You're thinking, yes! Finally, some peace and quiet. And then the realization kicks in. Must find the children, must find the children, must find the children. That's what we think. Must find the children. Now, knowing that we've lost the children and we're going to go and ask some people for help. As we go and ask some people for help, how do we describe the children to increase our chances of finding them? We give them everything, don't we? Hair color, eye color, what they're wearing, reach for a picture on our phone. We give them the most information possible about that specific person because the clearer the description, the more increased chances we have of finding that person. Yes or yes? 
that's what we do. See, I have two little girls, Amelia and Emily. If those are the ones that I lose, I'd quite like those ones back. <laughs> as much as they're a nuisance at times, I have grown fond of them over the years. <laughs> they're the ones I want back. See, with that description, who do I go and share it with? I go share it with everybody. On my way to trying to find people who have some leverage, who can help me find them quicker, people who have closed circuit television, people who have the ability to be able to get some other hands on deck, maybe police force or guards or somebody who can help, right? Because that's what we do with missing people, is we get laser focused on who we're looking for, and then we go out on the hunt for those people, utilizing the services of other people who know people like them or could help resource it. A change in thought process right now might mean that the people who aren't currently in your business, aren't they just missing people? They're missing from your profit share check. They're missing from your CRM system. They're missing from your prospect list. They're missing from your bank account. I don't care where they're missing from. I just know they're missing. And if you want to find the missing people, please know what it is that you're looking for. You're not looking for everybody. How many new people do you need in your organization in the next 12 months to give you your dreams and some? Five! You get to choose who the five are. If you were hosting a dinner party for five people, would you just blast it all over Facebook saying, hey, party at mine Friday night from seven? Probably won't work out too good, will it? But you say it's five, you choose the five. Here's the other thing, though, is if you want five to turn up, what must you definitely do? Invite at least five. <laughs> at least. I'm not even trying to tell you how many. I guess some people say, Phil, I really want people to build my team. I want to grow the organization. I know we can do something fantastic. I'm like, how many people have you invited to the party? They say, I want ten. I say, yeah, but how many have you invited? Three. Maybe one and a half, because one, I just kind of loosely mentioned the thing a thing. I didn't really, well, maybe one. That's the reality of it. Guys, you've got to be laser focused on who you want. I'm going to prove something to you for one second. Can you do me a favor? Just scan the room. Let's have the lights up a second. Guys, just have a look around for me. I want you to count. I want you to take 10 seconds for me and count for me the number of green items that you can see. Let's count from now. 10 seconds. Now, somebody please tell me, how many orange items did you count? I don't know a quicker or better way of showing you that you get what you focus on. All the time you're looking for anything and everything, I guarantee you what you will find is nothing. What you will be left with is the people that find you. See, if somebody chooses to find you, why might they have found you? Because somebody else decided they didn't want them anymore. <laughs> That's probably why. Which quite literally would mean if you're failing to choose what you want, you are feeding on somebody else's waste. Feel so good? Please execute your right to choose. Please be prepared to say, these are my people. Because the other crazy thing is they're not joining forever. They're joining you. And there'll be people that will join your team, that won't join your team, that will join yours, that wouldn't dream of hanging out with you, but would love to spend more time with you, and would be grateful to buy products from you, but wouldn't dream of even having five minutes in your company. It's just the way the world works. Be prepared to go find your people. Why? Because these are people you're going to hang out with for some time. The people you bring into your business, you might spend more time with these people than you do your significant others. Don't build an army of people that you can't deal with hanging around or you can't offer them what they need. Go make it count where it feels good for you because then it just becomes a little bit more fun. Who joined this business because they want more fun? So don't put miserable people in your team. <laughs> right? So we know who we're going to speak with. We're loads of focused on who we want. We're ready. We're excited. We're going to go out and we're going to make something happen. All you need to do, though, is just to make a certain number of contacts every day and the magic happens, yes? No. 
There's one thing I've learned about people who perform at the very highest of standards at anything, and the one thing that I've learned about anybody who performs at their absolute best is that what they will always do is spend some time in properly preparing. Many of you joined this business because you wanted to make a change, yes or yes? Do you look like the change you want to make, or do you still look like the person you used to be? Serious. You don't need to answer that to anybody other than yourself. Do you look like the person you want to grow into? I got a beautiful piece of advice once from a mentor of mine, a guy called Dave Paling. When I was in the furniture business, what Dave said to me, he said, Phil, my God, you want to be the general here, don't you? Like I was hungry, I was eager, I was keen, I wanted to rise through the ranks. He said, you want to be the general? I said, boss, I'm confused. What do you mean the general? He says, you want to be the main man and in the big money and control and the leader and stuff. I said, yeah, that's me. He said, Phil, if you want to be the general, the first thing you need to do is look like a general. Then you need to talk like a general, walk like a general, and act like a general. And one day, you'll wake up a general. People aren't prepared to do the work between the idea and the reality. That's one thing that's missing massively in society. They're not prepared to go through all the steps. There is no way to the top without passing every step on the way. You just choose the pace you can run at them. And if you get strong, you can jump a few at a time. No different to walking a set of stairs right at the Guinness storehouse name, right? No different. No different to walking that set of stairs. When it comes down to preparation, there's one really important thing that you must understand. Guys, you're being judged. Every time you step out, every time you open your mouth, every time you turn up in somebody else's presence, you are being judged. When could a sales opportunity arise? You know that to be true, right? Any time. So are you ready for a sales opportunity? Are you ready for it at any time? Or just when it's in your diary for that 20, 30 minute slot? Hands up right now who has the ability to be able to sign a new distributor today on them at this moment in time. Feels confident and ready to be able to deliver a presentation to somebody they met in the lobby in a second. Somebody who feels that at this moment in time they are dressed appropriately to represent their business towards the future success that they would like with certainty. If you are failing to control the things that you can control, don't be surprised the things that are out of your control catch up and overtake you. Spend more time controlling the stuff that nobody can change. And guess what? You start to make more of your own luck. We're judged so quickly. We're judged by the car that we drive. We're judged by the house that we live in. We're judged by the clothes that we wear. We're judged by, I mean, how good you can keep your fingernails. I've seen people lose business for the smallest of reasons. I was about to sign a giant contract with a property developer across in a European country. This was a 90 million euro property transaction. The guy spent an hour and a half explaining to us as a team their meticulous attention to detail in the construction process. And damn, I believed him. The presentation was so slick. At the end of the de deal, to sign it, he passes me the pen. And it was a chewed bic. Still with saliva on the end. I wasn't so sure where he was telling the truth about his meticulous attention to detail. It changed everything. The little things make the big difference. Guys, you are in control of the little things. Knowing that you are selling a lifestyle, that you are selling something that can change, don't think that you have to have achieved everything to be putting yourself in a position that you know you're going for it, but make some stuff that suits you perfectly. Let's take that cars thing, just for example. Some of you might drive a car right now that doesn't represent you in the way that you would like to towards the success of what this business could achieve. Would that be fair? Do yourself a favor. Sometimes you know it's right to drive the car and park it on the driveway. Sometimes park it down the corner. Sometimes take a train. <laughs> right? I'm not telling you to change your car. I'm saying don't let things that could judge you in the wrong direction stand in the way of your success. And the same can be said when it comes to having a big car. There was a guy I used to work with owned a debt management company helping people out of traumatic circumstances. People had got themselves in a little bit too deep with unsecured creditors. He used to go and see them and help them to overcome those situations with a fee-paying service. And he used to get people say to him that they were concerned his fees were too high. He drove a Jaguar XK8. His number plate said, owe it. Guys, I can't make this up. That happened. 
That was a true story. And he said to me, Phil, I don't understand it. How do we better demonstrate our value? I said, change your car, dude. Just change your car. Really? Or leave that one at home and get something that represents some more value. Know you're being judged and get ready for that process. Once we're properly prepared, there's a few other things we need to think about. Now, often one thing I hear is a challenge, an obstacle that many of you face. It's just a lack of confidence. I hear this a lot, that people are just telling, I'm not confident enough to stand in front of other people. I'm not confident enough to be able to speak to strangers. I'm not confident enough to be able to do this on my own. Confidence cannot come without one thing. There's one thing that is required for confidence to appear. It's called experience. You cannot have confidence without experience. So don't be surprised if you haven't got confidence at something you haven't done like a thousand times. Don't be surprised if you're not confident. There is a big difference, though, between confidence and self-belief. Categorically different things. I had the benefit of being involved in an interview with this guy. Anybody know who this guy is? Usain Bolt, the most decorated track athlete of all time. Pretty good at the stuff he does. In the interview with Usain Bolt, there were two things that I learned, two things that were vivaciously awesome to me. Number one was a question that was asked, which was, so what are you thinking on the start line of every race? What are you thinking? What's going through your mind? I'm interested. What's happening in mindset-wise for you at that moment? You know what he said? I'm thinking, why did everybody else bother turning up? That's what he was thinking. Wasn't worried about competition, looking over his shoulder. He was thinking, I got this. What you have in your business opportunity is a golden opportunity for the right person. It is a complete gift. It is as good as it could possibly be. You have the privilege through your business opportunity to be able to change people's lives. But only the right people. Don't let go of the fact that you have power in your opportunity. Peter Parker once said, anybody know who Peter Parker is better known as? Spider-Man. Peter Parker said, with great power comes great responsibility. You guys have great power and then the great responsibility to be able to bring this on board. But what needs to happen is people need to trade on your enthusiasm, your confidence, your belief. When Martin Luther King stood on stage, what did he say? I have a dream. He didn't say, I've got this cute little idea and I hope it might work out. Since say, I've been thinking that maybe we could be doing some changes and you might be able to help me. He was loud and proud and people knew where he was going. And guess what happened? People followed. If you haven't got certainty about where you're going, you expect nobody to follow you. If you are trying this with the purpose of saying, I'll see how I get on. And then once I get there, then other people will join me. I'm going to repeat something. You might want to write this down. Nobody wants to be a part of your test. Nobody. It's only once you find certainty that you will find people to join you. Only at that point. Nobody wants to be a part of your test. I said I learned two things from the Usain Bolt interview. Two things. The second thing was perhaps even more profound than the first. I said, how do you know then that you're definitely going to win? What is the thing that gives you that level of certainty, that air of confidence? He says, I'm the only guy in the race that when I'm running the 100 meters, I run the best 110 meters I can. See, he doesn't look to the finishing line and then rest. He plows on straight through that. The race he's running is longer than the race that everybody else is running. He's just getting into his stride when everybody else is thinking about finishing. Doesn't that come back round to the point we make about what you aim for? You short for, shoot for 4cc. How are you feeling when you're at 3.86? Nearly there. What happens if you shot for 10 and you missed and it came out 6.4? Wouldn't that be better? Now, you might have to live with some feeling of failure. This is an uncomfortable position I want you to get comfortable with. I want you to be okay that the little victories need to be celebrated, but you're really working on something bigger that you're probably not going to get for some time. But you are holding enough belief to be able to help you get there. So we know who we're looking for, yes? We've got laser focus in our mind about the people we're looking to go and get. We're properly prepared. We've got all of our equipment at hand. We're ready to be able to deliver a presentation should we need to. We know our product's inside out. Product knowledge is on point. We've got this laser focus self-belief. We're so bordering on arrogant. That's how high our confidence is. Just south of arrogant. Just a little lower. 
We're thinking, I've got this. Opportunity now presents itself, and we are looking at being able to say, let's enter into some conversations with other people, right? Because that's all this business is. It's just talking to strangers. That easy, right? Talking to strangers. Hands up in this room who loves talking to strangers. Yeah, like less than a third of you. For the rest of you guys, I need you to know that this is not your fault. If you at any point are finding it difficult talking to strangers, I need to let you know who to blame. See, it's not your fault at all. The reason that you find it difficult to talk to strangers is everything to do with what mum said. That's what happens, right? Mum said, don't talk to strangers, don't talk to strangers, don't talk to strangers. And you still hear that little voice inside your head of mum saying that you shouldn't be talking to strangers. There's a few things that you need to do to become excellent in the world of sales. Firstly, you have to understand what selling really is. Selling is earning the right to make a recommendation. That is a Phil Jones dictionary definition of what selling is. Earning the right to make a recommendation. And this means that we have to do this thing better than most. We have to learn how to create a genuine opportunity. Create. Please note it doesn't say wait for a genuine opportunity. Hope for a genuine opportunity or pray for a genuine opportunity. It says create. And this has to mean that an element of your success is within your control. So many people are waiting for something to happen, wishing that it would happen from somebody else's circumstances, blaming things like the weather, the opportunity, the currency market, or the fact there are too many other people stealing their customers. Your success is for you to blame. If there's something you want more of, who's got something that they like more of? More customers? More customers? Be prepared to ask yourself the question, what am I doing to help me generate more brand new customers? Because sometimes you're going to realize that the only thing you're doing is wishing, hoping, and praying. You're not actually doing anything. Not a thing. Just hoping. Or I then get things like, oh, no, no, I am working the business, and I quit my full-time job, and I'm working it, and I'm definitely working to get more new team members. I say, well, great, what have you done? They said, I sent five text messages today. Five messages. I sent my five messages. You get told you can be your own boss, Yes. If you were your own boss, would you employ you? Would you? You'd employ you. Now, I don't know your answer, nor do I mind your answer, but I need you to be honest with yourself on that answer. Does it add up? The money you want, the success that you choose, and the work that you're putting in, because quite often the answer is no, that's what I find. You're just not doing the thing. Just wishing, hoping, and praying. The activity needs to bleed the results. It doesn't matter how good you get at the activity. If you don't do enough of it, you won't get there. So make sure you're doing everything you can to create a genuine opportunity. I'm going to explain what your job is. This is a dictionary definition, job description, of what it means to be a successful network marketer. Here is your job description. To interrupt somebody's day for long enough to find a problem that they did not know they had, to introduce to them a solution that they wasn't aware was available, to help fix or help them achieve a goal that they didn't know they had the purpose towards. That is your job. Starts with interrupting somebody's day for long enough. Means talking to strangers. You guys are great at talking to strangers. You need to know how to have conversations effectively with strangers. This is a tough thing to do or an easy thing to do. Tell me, tough or easy? Easy to do, right? So we start a conversation with a stranger. This young lady says, it's easy. I heard you say it was easy, so that means we're going to have a conversation. So we're going to have a conversation. I'm a stranger. You want to talk to me. Go. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, very good. How's your day? That's where it goes, though, right? My day's fine, thanks. How's yours? Good, good. What did you get up to? Not a lot. You? This is it though, right? This is where we get to in conversation. We get that far. Hey, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks too. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. That's the whole thing, right? Happens all the time. We've got to get better. We've got to get smarter at that. Surely we can do things in a better way. This lady wants to have a go. I can see this. Come on, let's do this. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Okay. 
Okay, this is interesting, right? See, she thinks she's been smug. Let's see what happens next. See what happens next. Hi, how are you? I say I'm fine, thanks. She says I like your suit. You seem like a guy that likes to dress well. It's a bit creepy, isn't it? <laughs> Think for a second. Why would somebody say that? Right, why? Why would somebody say that? Now, girl to girl, I think you might be okay with that. Girl to guy, yeah. Guy to girl, forget it, right? <laughs> Just straight up forget it. You will get arrested. So a compliment is an idea, but be careful about how it can be delivered with grace. And ladies, I am being a pain on the backside on purpose to be able to illustrate some points. Our job is to talk to strangers. We've got to get good at talking to strangers. And so many of us put so much hesitation on this. Any of you ever been contact marketing? Contact marketing is a fun thing, right? Contact marketing. Who decided to call it contact marketing? Isn't that a weird thing to call something? Doesn't it sound like you're going to like... Contact marketing. Sounds like it might be painful. I think we might better do slightly better than that. Now, you're in the business of making friends. You're in the business of going out, starting conversations with strangers. Sometimes the thing that stands in your way, though, it isn't your attitude, it isn't your desire, because you've gone out to do this, haven't you? You've seen people. You've seen people that you wanted to approach, and you're like, they're definitely going to be perfect. I love them. I love our shoes. I'm going to tell her about her shoes. Shoes are good. I'm going to ask her where she got them from. I will. I'm going to ask her. Yeah, but she's with somebody. She is. Uh, yeah, in a minute. Maybe if I come over here, she'll see me. Yeah. And then we give up, don't we? We give up and we think we'll start again tomorrow. Here's the biggest secret when it comes to talking to strangers. This is a tool that will help you overcome so many different hurdles. This smooths over every edge in any given conversation. You have to understand this is a rule of life. This is a rule of influence. This is a powerful lesson. And you have to understand the first decision that anybody makes when they meet somebody for the very first time is, do I find you attractive? That is the first subconscious question we ask ourselves. Do I find this person attractive? Now, guys, this isn't a physical or a sexual attraction. It's just, are you giving off that warm, attractive glow? And we are all proven to be far more attractive when we do this. (laughs) Now, you know that to be true, but I might need you to practice. So, guys, can you look to the person to the left of you or to the right of you? Just partner up a second and prove you can do it. (laughs) Prove it. Here is another rule I need you to understand. This is a powerful rule that if you fail to understand its impact on the professional negotiation circuit, it will destroy your business. It will destroy it. The rule is thus. Nobody wants to do business with miserable gits. (laughs) They don't. Please do yourself a favor and make sure that those people are not you. And I know you're all dead happy people, right? You're always dead happy. I mean, this is forever. Everybody's happy here. Everybody's happy. I get it. But sometimes you might be forgetting to tell your face. (laughs) Fail to do that bit, then the other people don't know. I've been around you long enough. I know you're all happy people. I get it. But a stranger, when you're wearing serious face, doesn't know that you're happy on the inside. You have to let them know by lifting these corners up. Sounds so silly, guys, but it's not. It really isn't that silly. Because what I see people when they have opportunities to go speak to other people to create opportunity to be able to win business in this industry, instead of speaking to strangers and smiling at them with every part of their body, they do this instead. And I mean it, they shrink. Their shoulders come in, everything. It's like, how small, how small can I get so they don't see me? They don't see me, but I'm trying try my best right that's what happens be prepared to smile with everything that's about you be prepared to be one of those happy people be prepared to be the person that's looking towards other people to engage in a conversation and life gets easier we still need to know how to open a conversation with a stranger though right we need to know how to be able to do this and you've got to be able to do things with some sincerity who is the most important person in your life 
If you're in any doubt, remember the school photo. It was 300 faces wide. What was the first one you looked for? <laughs> Knowing that you are the most important person in your life, who is the most important person in your prospect or your customer's life? They are. Yet what the mistakes we tend to make is we want to have what I call shiny object say, uh, syndrome over our products or service. We want to like vomit all the reasons on somebody as to why they would love what we're about because we're so excited about it. And then we want to tell them all the wonderful things he's done for us. There's a set of words I'd like you to ban from your vocabulary. My team. And I know that might come as a bit of a shock. But in the politest possible sense, I do not want to be part of your team. Because why would I want this business? If I read much company literature, not just of this company, but nearly every company in the land, there are two letters that appear time and time again. We were founded at this point in time. We pride ourselves on our customer service. We continually give back towards society. We this, we that, we the other. You overuse the word we, what you quite literally do is we all over your customers. <laughs> they won't like it. They won't, promise. They are the most important person in their life. Just you are the most important person in your life. You want to know what to talk to somebody about? Talk to them about themselves. They're the most interesting subject in the world to them. So we're going to start a conversation with a stranger. We're going to try something another way around. In fact, let me just kick something up a second. It's, um, you, sir, tell me about the last place you went on your holidays. Florida, I love Florida. I get to go to Florida three, four times a year because I'm a speaker. And because I get to speak, Florida's a great hub for convention centers. So I go there, I get to play golf. Some of the pools and the beaches are good. Have you ever been to Miami? Because Miami's great. And not many people see that as Florida, but it definitely is. And it's not my favorite of states. I prefer the West Coast. Beaches out in California are way better than Florida. Love it down there. But America is somewhere I get to spend a load of time. Because I've got a home in New York City. My fiance is from America too. So we have a great time over there. But I'm British born. Still though, I've been to 56 countries. Like thousands of them. It's been a great time getting to do what I do because I'm pretty freaking awesome <laughs> how's that feeling <laughs> awful right that happens though guys we ask somebody a question thinking we are showing interest in them and then proceed to give them our version of their truth can we try again remind me your name again say again sorry Kahol. tell me about the last place you went on your holidays Florida wow when was that Last September, so pretty recent. Hey, what did you like about it there in Florida? Oh, you went to Universal. Cool. What would you get up to there? I haven't been for ages. Oh, we like roller coasters. What's the best one right now then? No? Don't remember the name. You say we. Who did you go with? Oh, excellent. Awesome. So what are some of the other stuff that are outside of roller coasters you got up to there? You went to Disney too, so you like did the whole thing. Is it as good as people say it is? I think so. You think so? Cool. Now, this is a weird conversation here, right? I mean, bless him, he's doing a fantastic sterling job. There's like 350, 400 eyeballs on him, and he's like, Aah! Imagine what would have happened, though, is if we're having this conversation out in a bar somewhere, it's just the two of us chatting. You'd have got to a point where you'd been telling me all the color about your holiday in, um, in Florida, right? And it would have been kind of fun. But the first few questions would have been a bit clunky, wouldn't they? They'd be like short answers. Just give me a fact, and I've got to ask another question. You're going to give me another fact. I'm going to give you another question. Then it starts to feel kind of nice. Everybody wants to be somebody. Everybody. Yet what happens in real world, in life, is nobody has time to stop to show any interest in any other people. Hence the, hey, how are you? You say, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I say, I'm fine, thanks. And we've got nowhere else to go. This was even worse the other day. What happened to me is I'm at Starbucks. Starbucks in the US, I'm up early, I'm grabbing myself a cup of coffee. And I'm having a chat with a girl behind the, um, behind the barrister thing. She's a nice girl, liked it, barista, made me nice coffee, etc. We're having a little bit of chinwag. She asked me what I do. I tell her about my work, tell her about a conference I've got going on later on. And we're getting on like a house so far. I think this is nice. And she was kind of cute. And um, at the end of it, she's got my name on the cup. She turns it around to me. She says, you have a nice day, Phil. Hope the conference goes well. I thought, that's nice. So I walk away. As I'm walking away, I think, hmm, I wonder if she meant that. 
you know, the whole have a nice day thing. And I wonder if she's really interested in how my conference goes. I wonder. So I went back. And I asked her. I said, you know, we were chatting earlier on, and, and, and you asked me about my conference. Do you want me to come back later and tell you how it went? And you know what she said? No. <laughs> she says, it's just, just what we say, you know. We're just trying to be nice. Don't be caught just trying to be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Show genuine interest in other people. Make it like you really care. How many questions did I prepare here? How many questions? Only one. And then I built some other questions based on what? On his answers. Which meant I had to do what? Listen. Many of you will have prospects buy into your business opportunity if you don't get in their way. They'll talk themselves into buying from you if you don't interrupt their flow. For many of you, for fear of not being a salesperson, you become a sales prevention officer. <laughs> Do you know that people like buying stuff? Did you know that? People actually like buying stuff. And you stand in their way. So I only prepared a handful of questions. It started to get quite nice, but I had to get like six, seven questions in before we got to anything that was more than one word that made you think about us having a conversation because that's how stuff ever happens. How many of you have seen the movie Shrek? In the movie Shrek, Shrek says, ogres are like onions. They have layers. People are the same. We have layers. We have layers that need to be peeled back one at a time. If you want to enter into conversation with other people, be prepared to ask a question, shut up and listen. Ask another question about something they've told you, shut up, listen. Ask another question, find out what's going on in their world, shut up, listen. And you know the nice thing is, even if you're really boring, they won't find out. <laughs> they won't know, because they're so excited talking about themselves, they'll think you're brilliant. You try this stuff on other people, you watch what happens next. There'll be somebody you both know that you've been speaking to this way around. They'll come back and they'll go, wow, he or she's brilliant, like a stunning conversationalist. But you've told them nothing about you. Here are some precise words you can use to encourage other people to talk about themselves. Because when they talk about themselves, you find a reason to be able to introduce the business when they're talking about themselves enough. These are precise words, many of which are difficult to spell. But they are words like, uh-huh, eh, really, wow, cool, nice. What do those words say? And go on, go on, keep going, go on, go on, go on. They provide the encouragement for the other person to be able to provide something. And one of two things will happen if you run into conversation that way. One of only two things will happen. Here are the two things. Thing number one is you find an opportunity for a problem in their world that you might be able to fix. You'll find it. Because nobody wants to do what you do, you know that. I've spoke to kids, I've said, how do you feel about introducing aloe vera based products to kids, to adults in your future life? Do you know how many kids have said they're up for it? <laughs> you don't meet kids that say, when I grow up, what I want to do is this. You know, I'd love to be in living rooms. I've had this dream of being in strangers' living rooms where you have to wipe your feet on the way out and to be able to meet all their friends and family and talk to them about health and nutrition products. That's what I'd love to do. They want what you've got. They want the results of what you do. They want the outcomes of what you do. That's what people want. But if you find a reason why somebody might want to improve their health, or a reason why somebody might want to make more money, now you're not a salesperson. You're a friend, helping them get the thing they said they needed some help with, if you listen for long enough. So there's thing number one that might happen. If it's not thing that, number one that might happen, what might happen instead is they run out of things to say. There's one question that is guaranteed to be asked in the situation when somebody doesn't know what to say in a conversation between two strangers. What's the one guaranteed question you're bound to be asked? It's asked in 98% of conversations with a stranger. So what do you do then? See, there was you looking to try and find a way to shoehorn in your business opportunity as to why somebody would love to be involved in your thing. If you wait long enough, they'll ask you. You will get invitations to make business presentations. But don't think it is an invitation to make a business presentation. 
Don't catch me wrong here. Customer says to you, so what do you do then? You're ready, right? Who knows the answer? Isn't it stupid that there's a question you know you're going to be asked that you haven't prepared an answer for? Best answer to so what do you do is, who's going to help me? Volunteer? <laughs> Didn't go so well last time, did it? I'm going to introduce you to the simplest of ways of being able to approach this question. And it's another rule that you might want to understand. And the rule you might want to understand is that a story will always sell, whereas a fact will only tell. So next time somebody asks you, what do you do? Please don't tell them. Tell them a story that illustrates what you do. And if you're really scared of launching straight into a story, ask them this question. Would you mind if I give you an example of the type of thing that we do? What do you think everybody's going to say to that question? Yeah, sure, go for it. Well, why don't I tell you about somebody that I was working with last week. There's a young mum who's at home with her kids, and she was scared about getting back to work, and she didn't really have the time. She wanted to spend more time with her, with her family and loved ones. So what we did is we helped her to set up a small business working from home that meant she could spend more time with her kids and build a serious part-time income working around her family, failing her, well, without the need to go back to work. See how that story works now. As instead of saying, I work under the umbrella of, or in the health and nutrition industry, because what happens with the story? Do you know people remember stories? The worst that happens if you tell a story following the so what do you do question, the worst that happens is somebody says, that's interesting. It's as bad as it gets. But the best that happens is tell me some more. But if you get the worst case scenario, here's what happens next. They still remember the story. They take the story away, they keep the color on it, and next time they bump into somebody who says, you know what, I, um, I really don't want to go back to work. I really don't want to go. I'd love to be able to stay at home and spend more time with the kids, but I just don't know what my options are. What does the person who heard the story now say? I know somebody. I know somebody that might be able to help because I met this person the other day. How many of you like to know somebody when somebody is in a time of need? Only everybody. Use this to your advantage too. Successful people know what to focus on. They know how to get their own way, but I want to focus on one tiny little point of something I said a second ago. We've got to a point where we are ready, ready, ready. We're inspired. We know what we're looking for. We've got some idea how to open some conversations with strangers. I said that what we had to do, though, was create a genuine opportunity. We talked about some of the things that we can do to create. And the only thing that we have to do to create anything is to be able to start conversations. Conversations start with questions. Did you know that? Every conversation starts with a question. Questions start conversations, conversations lead to relationships, relationships create opportunities, opportunities lead to sales. That pattern will never change. Questions create conversations, conversations create relationships, relationships create opportunities, opportunities lead to sales. Repeat. So if you're not getting the outcome that you're looking for, you might not be asking enough questions. Don't think questions lead to sales. They don't. Got to get through all five bases. But I did say that there's a point that we need to focus on. The point we need to focus on here it says create a genuine opportunity. There's one word in that four, sent four word sentence that is remarkably important to you. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm going to give you a clue. The word is genuine. Who could benefit from this business opportunity? Not everybody. I hear people talk about sales. They're like, somebody, this guy's so good. Sell ice to Eskimos, this guy. So good. So good, he'll sell sand to the Arabs. If you're an Arab and you bought a load of sand, how do you feel tomorrow? Is this a good thing? See, if you introduce your products to somebody who doesn't benefit from it and then five days later they don't like it, what happens? And the product comes back at whose expense? Yours, inevitably, right? Inevitably, this comes back as at your expense. So please be certain that what we're actually only looking to be able to do is to par the right product with the right person at the right time, the right opportunity with the right person at the right time, because that's what we build a reputation on. Who here would like themselves or their business to be described as remarkable? Who'd like that? Yeah? 
What's meant by the word remarkable? <laughs> it's funny, right? You pick a word to describe you, but nobody knows what it means. It means worthy of remark. It means people are talking about you. It's as simple as it is. Worthy of remark. People talking about you for the right reasons. That's what we need to happen. Create more stories where people are talking about you for the right reasons. Create more success through your teams. Create people feeling like they're successful. And what is success in this business? Whatever success means to the person you're talking to. Different things for different people. Perhaps put best by my late grandma. My nan was a huge mentor in my life. She said, Phil, if everybody thought in the exact same way, wouldn't the whole world like to marry your granddad? <laughs> different things at different times. But I do want to focus on that word genuine. Imagine for a second right now that you are in the hamburger business. And you've decided you want to operate in the premium end of the hamburger business. So you get all organic meats, you get the finest in local ingredients in the lettuce and the pickles and the tomatoes, only locally sourced brioche buns, you're thinking these are the best in the business. And you're launching, you want to be attractive within your price point, so you cut out all of your competition. You've got this beautiful burger, you're going to take it to market, you're going to make a fortune. So the first place you go to try and introduce your burgers to the marketplace is the Vegan Music Festival. How good a salesperson do you need to be to shift these burgers on this day? But if you had the worst burger in the land and you turn up outside the match last night, how many burgers are you going to shift? Lots. Please make sure you're having the right conversation with the right person at the right time. Don't try pushing stuff uphill. If people don't see it or catch it or aren't interested on it, smile and move on. You're not looking to be able to change people from a no to a yes. You're looking to deal with all that area in the middle. It's all the maybes. Play with the maybes. Ignore all the people who are a categoric no. Now, I ain't going to get a vegan to try my burger regardless of how good my burger is. But I will get people who are interested in eating burgers to realize that mine might be the best burger that they could tuck into. And if I turn up at the right place, my opportunity can then be marked as genuine. Does that make sense, yes or yes? So go hang out where your people are. And there are a few things that need to happen if you're gonna find your people. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna find problems your opportunity can fix. You're gonna find problems that your products can fix. And then you're gonna get excited because you're gonna think here's an opportunity. Somebody might join my team. No, I get a chance to be able to help somebody with a problem. They might join my team. So you get excited, and now you're going to give them all the information they need to make a decision. But before you do that, you have to ask some questions. Because isn't it questions that create opportunities? Questions create opportunities. Questions create opportunities. You've got to get real good at asking questions. I figured, why don't I help you with this? Why don't I help you with a three-stage questioning technique that you can use? to get just about anybody to do just about anything. Would anybody like a three-stage questioning technique that you can use to get just about anybody to do just about anything? Yes or no? I need you to help me, though. If I'm going to give this to you, will you pinky promise that you will not use this for any reason other than finding more customers and bringing on more people to your team or helping team members to develop and overcome some of their insecurities? You won't use it for any other purpose. Promise? Promise. 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 Hands up who loves what they do and would do it if they didn't get paid. All of it. Every single part of it. Because some of it's just work, isn't it? And um, who'd like to make more money in the next 12 months than they've ever made in their whole entire life? Keep your hand raised for me right now if you know of at least one thing you could or should be doing that would make you more money and you're still not doing it. So here you are on a training course, learning how to gather new skills to go out and make more money. You already know of loads of things that could make you more money, which is the thing that you said you want, and you still can't be asked to do it. Why? Why are you not doing the things you know you should be doing to get you the thing that you said you wanted? Why not? I think I know why not. Because the excuses that you're making in your mind right now, if I was to hold a gun to your head, or to hold one of your loved ones hostage, would the same excuses apply if the thing that you're telling yourself you can't do was the thing you needed to do to release your loved ones or to stop yourself getting a bullet in the brain? Would the excuses still wash so much? Or would you just figure it out? And it wouldn't be that hard, would it? It'd be like, that's it? 
That's all you need me to do when I get my loved ones back? Fine, got it. What are we doing this afternoon? Be easy to be able to do. There's a big reason that most people don't do the things they know they should be doing. It's the simplest reason in the world. The simplest reason in the world is they don't understand the power of this word. One of the most overused words in the world of business. And most people don't even understand what it means. Can I help you? Splits. This is the word derives from. First part of the word comes from the Latin word mutavus. The Asian part of the word derives from the word that we now know as action. Matavis translates to the modern day word motive. So what we have is motive and action are the two words that make up that word. Another word for the word motive would be, if somebody had a motive, they had a, a reason. And if somebody was to take action, they're going to do something or move. Would it be fair to say that if the reason was big enough, you can get just about anybody to do just about anything if the reason was big enough? This is the core principle that you need to understand if you want to get other people to do stuff. If you'd like to get your own way more often, understand the power of that. But here's what we now need to understand is the big reason why people don't do what they know they should do to get the things they say they want. It's the simplest reason in the world. It's because they're comfortable. That's why. Because you're fine as you are. Hands up in this room who likes change. <laughs> Guys, do me a favor, fold your arms. No, not that way, the other way. Woo! Just weird. It's like you're being hugged by a stranger. Anybody ever got home from work one day? Tired. It's like being a long day. It's been a shift. You got back in, you're still dressed in all your work clothes. And what you do is you get yourself on the couch. And you like sit yourself down on the couch because you're exhausted, tired. And it kind of goes something like this. Ugh. Oh. You lay there on the couch, shoes are on, jackets on, bags still to one side. You're just laying out on the couch. Woo. And then you think to yourself, you think, you know what? If I went and got changed, man, I'd be more comfortable. Man, I would. It'd be great. And if I lay that way, woo, it'd be game changer. It would. It'd be great. Five minutes go by. Ten minutes. 25, this is fine. This is fine. This is nice. I like it. See, it doesn't matter how much we can know that there is a position in our life that is way more comfortable than this one. When fine is fine, more comfortable doesn't matter. Does that point make a point to you guys? How many of your prospects are fine as they are, yet would quite like something to be better? Now, if you're fine as you are, nothing's going to change. So let me like, try and relate this to this three-stage questioning technique. And um, who believes they're going to maybe be slightly better off 12 months on from now than where they are today? Only everybody. Let's use that to your advantage. Here's how this three-stage questioning technique is going to work. First stage of this questioning technique is I'd like you to ask your prospect or your team member something about something they are looking forward to. Their plans about something they're looking forward to. How many of your team members or potential team members are looking forward to something? All of them. Ask them about that. So what are your plans over the next 12 months? Well, we're hoping to be able to put an extension on the house, or we're hoping to take the kids on holiday, or we've got plans to be able to go to Disney World, or we've got plans to be able to maybe uh, do some other home improvements. Everybody's got something they're looking forward to, yes? Get them to color it in for you, that when they tell you what the thing is, use the same technique that we used over here a second ago, that when they give an answer, you say, tell me more. When they give an answer, you say, tell me more, so that you can see it clearly. When you can see it clearly, how well can they see it? Like crystal. Now, when you're thinking about something you're looking forward to, how do you feel? Feel pretty good, right? And do you know that enthusiasm itself is a catalyst of decision? When you're feeling good about stuff, life gets a little bit easier. And have you ever been on a holiday, bought a load of stuff you didn't need? Got back, opened the suitcase, thinking, what was I thinking? It's nice. See, the feelings drive the outcome. First part of this question technique is a plan-based question. Get somebody excited about something they're looking forward to. Knowing that feelings drive decision, second part of this question technique is to ask them how are they going to feel when they get to that point in time in the future. 
So you've done it then. You've built the big extension. The kids get the extra room back. They get the room each. You can entertain and you can get all those people around that you've been longing to be able to do. Christmas time, finally, you can get a dining room table that everybody can sit around and nobody sat on the floor. How's that going to feel knowing you've done all of that? What do you think people are going to say? Feel pretty good. They might need a little encouragement. I know in the UK there's lots of people, yeah, all right. But you know when you mouth the words of an emotion... You cannot help but experience a fraction of that emotion in that minute. So when you say the words, I would feel proud, you get pride. Can't help it. Not the full dose, but enough to make you go, whoo. Just to raise yourself up a touch. How's your prospect feeling right now? You're talking about their happy place, correct? Then you've asked them how they're going to feel when they get there. They tell you how wonderful they're going to feel. How comfortable are they feeling right now? They're thinking about this heightened level of comfort for their future. It's looking like a good place. Third stage of this questioning technique is where the magic happens. We're now going to break their dream. We're now going to make them uncomfortable. I'm going to ask them what the consequences would be of this thing not working out. So what would the consequences be if you fail to generate the revenue to be able to build this extension to give your family back those dreams that you talked about? What would be the consequences of that? What do they now see in their mind's eye? Monster in face, right? That's what they're seeing. They are staring the monster in the face straight down the barrel. They're in a situation where now they're ready to be able to make a change. Plan-based question. How are they going to feel when they get there? What happens if it doesn't work out? I'm going to try and add some color on this to you guys to help you understand the power of this exact situation. See these doors at the back of the room? They don't go out to the lobby. Behind those doors is a sheer drop to the floor. And we are 87 stories high right now. 87 stories high. But it's okay, because adjacent is another building, 150 yards away. Has an identical set of doors, equally 87 stories high. Fixed at this building is a steel braided wire. It is an inch and a quarter thick. It's perfectly fixed to this building. It's stretched out tight. It's perfectly fixed across the way. But 150 yards, guys, there's some bounce. Rumor has it there's some moisture in the air once you get 87 stories high. So it's a little bit slippery. But I'm just wondering, when I'm done, end of today, who fancies it just for fun, for giggles? Maybe we'll walk across, see what happens. Anyone up for it? Okay, I'll make it interesting. What if I make you a bit more comfortable and give you 10 euros? Who's up for it now? 100? 1,000 euros. 10,000 euros. There's like a couple back there going, yeah, maybe. 100,000? <laughs> There's a few people now asking some questions. For most of you in this room, though, there isn't a number that I could get to that would make you want to do the thing you don't really want to do. Isn't a number that I could get to. But what if by alternative, I did something different? I'm not incentivizing you with cash to get across the tightrope. In this room, it's starting to get warm. I mean, crikey warm. I mean, what's happening is flames are licking at your face and smoke's filling up your lungs kind of warm. The only way out of that building is through those doors, over the tight ropes of the safe building on the other side. Who wants out right now? Only everybody. People do not move to become more comfortable. People always move to avoid a discomfort. Be aware of that, and what happens is is life gets easier in the decision-making process. Plan-based question, how are you going to feel when they get there? What happens is if it doesn't work out? I showed you the good news, didn't I? 10 euros, 100 euros, million euros. When I ask somebody a plan-based question and how they're going to feel when they get there, I've just shown them a million euros worth of happiness in their money. As good as it gets to them in their life at that moment in time, what does the third question do? Sets the building on fire. It's the contrast between where somebody wants to be and where they don't want to be that creates the reason for somebody to move. When all you're dealing with is where somebody is remarkably comfortable and saying, come with me, it will be a little bit more comfortable, the gap isn't big enough to drive a change with all of the people all the time. Lift the bottom, and now all of a sudden, the top looks more attractive. And pull the rug out from underneath people sometimes, not in an unethical way, just in an honest way, to allow them to be able to see for themselves what happens if they don't. Now, I tell you that that has just about anybody ready to move in just about any way. It has people ready to do stuff. It does come with a health warning, though. 
You cannot ask a plan-based question. How somebody's going to feel when they get there and what happens if it doesn't work out if you don't have a solution for them? Can't just say, well, good luck. I call that questioning technique prodding the bruise. It's about taking somebody's open wound and agitating it a little. You can only do it if you're safe in the knowledge of saying, well, that's exactly why I'm here. The good news for you is, don't worry, that's why we're having this conversation. And at that point, you can introduce the business opportunity to them. But when it comes to introducing the business opportunity, we've got to do that right too. We've got to get this point in the right kind of way. And it means that what we have to do is to give enough information to make a decision. Yet how much information is enough? I am 100% certain that every single one of you in this room has lost or delayed a decision from giving too much information. How big a decision is this? How big a decision is it to give the C9 a go? Big decision or small decision in the grand scheme of life? All I know is it's not for you to say. Don't make the decision any bigger than it needs to be, though. See the mobile phone that you have with you right now. How many things did you need to know about what it could or should do before you decided that that's the one for you? If the person in the store tried to explain to you every feature and every benefit that was available on that device, you would still be there now at this point in time. But you're not. And why did you pick it? For many of you, you picked it because you like the color. You picked it because the battery life was better. How many reasons does somebody need to know it's good enough for it to be good enough? One, providing it's the right one. Give enough information to make a decision, enough. And you know you can always give too much, so don't. Give less, they can ask for more, you can come back with more. Do you ever get customers ask you questions like, so how does this work then? You're telling them about one of your products, they say, how does it work? And you get into the detailed science of how it works. Do you want the best answer to the question when they say, how does this work? When they ask you, so this C9 thing, how does it work? Here's your answer. It works great. Trust me, right? So these bee pollen tablets, how do they work? Yeah, they work great. Nine times out of ten, if you take that advice away and you put it into practice, you're going to be mesmerized at the results you can get. It works great. Because people didn't want to know how it works. They just want to join the conversation. Just want to get involved. How does it work? It works great. Yet there is one piece of information you must get really good at giving people if you want them to make a buying decision. What's one thing people must know if they're going to buy something from you? Say again for me. Got to know the price. Now I heard some of you mutter a word that started with C. It was a four-letter C word. You know that four-letter C words are banned in public, correct? So please ban the word cost from your vocabulary. Cost is costing you. How do you feel about the cost in your life? Good thing or a bad thing? They're naturally painful. So the minute you label something a cost, it's bad news. Do your products give returns? Does your business opportunity give returns? If you put money into something and it gives returns, what's it called? It's called an investment. So people can invest in the C9 for their health and their family's future. They can invest in your business opportunity. Do you feel prouder of your investments than you do the cost in your life? Change how you label something and it will change how somebody receives it. How many of you in this room like expensive things? So do many of your potential customers. Don't be afraid of the fact that some of your products carry a premium price ticket. People like expensive things. Who loves to buy cheap and cheerful? Interesting, isn't it, right? I ask for a show of hands in the room, who likes expensive things? I get more than a third of the room put their hand up. I ask who likes cheap and cheerful, and I get two hands. Yet we all spend all of our time focusing on the people that want to find the cheapest. We have to be able to set our stall out accordingly towards the consumers that see value within our product offering. Guys, if I have the word price written in my right hand and the word value written in my left hand, and price comes out before value, which one looks bigger? Price looks bigger now, right? But if I get the value out there up front, which one looks bigger now? Value looks bigger. Any of you ever spent more money on something than you said you would? 
Only everybody. Customers will do the same, but they have to want the thing before they know how to get the thing. Don't have it standing in the way of your success. But there is success at every level. Let me try and make a really simple example. I'm going to come and steal something. Young lady, can I borrow your pen? Your name, sorry? Maria. Maria. So Maria's lent me this pen here. It's a beautiful pen. But if this pen is, um, say, chucked on a table at a car boot sale, how much is the pen? 50 cents? I mean, that would be a premium for it. What if I take the exact same pen? The exact same pen now, and I put it in a stand. The stand is made of acrylic, and it has 12 identical pens in the compartment adjoining this pen. And in the adjacent compartments, I have other pens in different colors by the same manufacturer. And then the manufacturer's name is across the top. Then I take the stand, and I put it on the counter in the stationery department of a mid-priced department store like a John Lewis. How much is the pen? It's the same pen. The exact same pen. Now if I take the exact same pen and I lay it down on its side, and I put it in a box, and the box is made of mahogany, and the box is velvet lined. So I have a pen in a mahogany box that's velvet lined, sits in a cabinet, and the cabinet is made of glass. And the glass cabinet is spotlit. So I have a pen in a mahogany box that's velvet lined and a glass cabinet that's spotlit. Sits in a department store, not just any department store. The department store is in London. Not just anywhere in London, it's in Knightsbridge. The store in question is called Harrods. So I have a pen in a mahogany box that's velvet lined, that sits in a glass cabinet, that's spotlit, that sits in a department store, not just any department store, it's in Knightsbridge in London. The store is called Harrods. And to get to the pen, I need to speak to a member of staff. The member of staff is wearing a black tuxedo. He has white gloves on, and his name is Pierre. <laughs> How much is the pen? It's the same pen. I do not know a better way of demonstrating to you that there are people in a marketplace selling a similar product to you for remarkably different prices. What is the difference between the pen in all of those scenarios? Everything that goes with it. And if you're in any doubt of the things that are presented alongside your product, these are the things that you are in control of as an FBO. You're in control of the difference. And if you're wondering why people aren't prepared to pay the price that you're asking, maybe you need to hold up a mirror and say, are you making enough of a difference between that product and the customer's expectation for them to see the value that you provide? That's how we build a market at a premium end. And people love to buy premium. We just proved it. But you can't buy champagne for lemonade money. And if you have a lemonade budget, you have to find the best lemonade that you can. So understand that not everybody's your customer. And be prepared to serve the ones that fit what you're about best. Enough information to be able to make a decision. Maria, thank you for your pen. Let me get this one back to you. That was a really kind, kind gift. Finish this sentence for me. If you don't ask, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? We know that to be true, yet still we get to the position with our consumers. We've done a one-to-one. -one. We've given them all the information to be able to make a decision. They know the price, they know the marketing plan, they know the products, they know what's involved. And here's what we do instead. Instead of asking for a decision, what we do is this. Well, let me know then, won't you? I'll leave this with you and you know where I am. If you don't ask... You don't get. We know that to be true. People say that salespeople are born and not made. Have you ever met a three-year-old that doesn't ask for what they want? See, three-year-olds are brilliant at asking for what they want. They get so good at it, you see, because if they ask for what they want and they don't get it, what do they do? They ask again. And if they don't get it after asking again, what do they then do? Throw themselves on the floor, throw a crazy tantrum, and guess what happens? They get what they want. So what happened was is adults started to tell lies to children. Lies like it's rude to ask. Lies like I want doesn't get. But it does, doesn't it? If you ask for the right thing at the right time, it gets you more of what you want. What would happen if restaurants didn't say, would you like a coffee after your meal? How many coffees would they sell? Isn't that like the stupidest idea? Coffee keeps you up, stops you from sleeping. I've just finished my dinner. It's 11.30 p.m. at night. Would you like a coffee? Okay. 
We don't mind it's a bad idea. We still go, okay, yeah, great. So be prepared to ask for the thing you want. I could spend hours with you giving you multiple different tools for closing. Hours. But before I can get you good at asking for the thing you want, you've just got to get asking. What does it say if you don't ask? It says that you might not believe. And if you're not convinced with absolute certainty that your business is the right opportunity for this person at this time, or you're not convinced with absolute certainty that this product will make a difference to that customer at that time, guess what? They won't be convinced either. If you are not convinced you cannot convince, make sure that you have that dedication in your thought process and get good at asking. We can ask for the business, but what else might we want to ask for? More stuff like more referrals, right? More referrals would be great. This is network marketing, it's multi-level marketing, it's also referred as referral marketing as a business. Who in the room would like more referrals? Only everybody. Do you know the biggest reason why you're not getting enough right now? It's because you're not asking. So go ask. I can help you more than that though, can't I? There are three reasons that people don't ask for referrals as often as they should. One is, the too lazy, bone idle and cannot be bothered. And you know people only do two things in life. One is what they enjoy doing and the other is what they get checked on. So if you don't enjoy asking and nobody's checking, you're just not going to do it. But that's not you guys. They're the guys that don't come to meetings. So it must be one of the other two reasons. Either you don't know when to ask or you don't know how. Haven't been to the course that said here are the precise words that you can use to get other people to agree to take action. Other people to commit to give you referral business. Let's deal with the when. The when that you ask is when the other person is happy. That's it. Just understand when your customer, your prospect, your consumer, even your no, not today is happy, what do they say from their mouth? What words do they say when people are happy? Thank you. Next time a consumer says the words thank you to you, please don't pat yourself on the back and think you've done brilliant. When somebody says the words thank you to you, understand what is meant by the word thank you. Because when somebody gives you their thanks, it means they feel like they owed you. Saying the words thank you is because you felt slightly indebted. And if you feel indebted, is that a good time to ask somebody for something when you feel like you owe them? There's your moment. So next time you hear the words thank you from your customer, don't pat yourself on the back. Instead, go, aha! You feel like you owe me. Don't say that out loud. Do that bit in your head. <laughs> you feel like you owe me. What possibly could I ask for? So there's always more, right? Always more you can ask for. And if you haven't got something specific, your fallback is referrals. We now need to know how to ask, though. There's your when. Set these little antennas to listen to the word thank you. Use it as a cue card or a prompt. We need to now know exactly what to say. And you know that quite often the difference between you and somebody like you is knowing exactly what to say, when to say it, and how to make it count. Your word choices are essential towards your success. Getting this stuff right can be the difference between winning and coming second, and we know what second place pays. It pays nothing. So I'm going to help you with some precise words, and I'm going to share with you a couple of my magic words. Magic words is a little book that I wrote that I'm kind of proud of. And I'm proud of this book for a few different reasons. I'm proud because it's a bestseller. It's now sold over 120,000 copies. It's translated into three different languages. It's shipped all around the world. But I'm proud of it for other reasons other than just its best-selling status. Because my little best-selling book outsold Fifty Shades of Grey. Right? For one hour. <laughs> On Kindle. But we celebrate the little victories. We've talked about that. But I'm also proud of it because it helps people. It's 37 pages long. Because I learned people in business are great at buying books. I repeat, they're great at buying books. Not so good at reading them. So if my book was 37 pages long, four of them are blank, it has big font pictures in it, and you can read it 15 minutes cover to cover, guess what happens? People read it and they feel smart. Read a book. But it helps people get results. This is a book with sequences of words that talk straight to the subconscious brain. Subconscious brain is remarkably powerful in the decision-making process. Why? It's because it makes decisions for you without thinking. Cool, right? Like an autopilot or a computer. Has a yes or a no in subconscious, no maybe. If you can talk to part of somebody's brain with no maybe, you're having great results with no maybe. And if you can talk to it and get the yes or the no as you choose, then that's a pretty big thing too. Some of you might still be thinking, though, well, I still don't get what this subconscious brain thing is. 
it's your human autopilot. So if you think last night when you went to bed, did you have to remind yourself to breathe in and breathe out? That way you don't die? And it just happened. What about that familiar car journey where you remember getting in the car and you remember arriving, but you've got no memory at all of the journey itself? Subconscious brain took the drive. Don't worry if anything changed, anything weird cropped up, conscious brain would kick in and you'd be fine. But we rely on it because otherwise days would be phenomenally exhausting. You've got to be able to learn how to use this for you. And you've got to be able to learn how to talk to it. Some of you still right now still might be confused at what this subconscious brain thing is. You might even be thinking you don't have one. And if you're thinking you haven't got a subconscious brain, it's no more than that little voice inside your head. And if any of you are thinking that you haven't got a little voice inside your head, then it's the little voice that's telling you you haven't got a little voice. <laughs> Knowing that this thing is true, we've got to learn how to talk to it to get other people to do stuff. And I'm going to give you a set of words that you can use to get just about anybody to agree to do just about anything without even knowing what the thing is. It's cool, right? Set of words that you can use to get just about anybody to agree to just about anything without them even knowing what the thing is. And um, yeah, in fact, I'm looking for a volunteer, Ian. You can help me out. Ian, could you do me a small favor? Yes. There's the words. See, I ask Ian to do me a small favor, and if the guys can put Ian's mic on for me, then that might help, because you can play the other side of this conversation. Okay. Those are the words. You ask somebody to do you a small favor. You get just about anybody at just about any time to agree to do just about anything. Okay. You don't even know what I'm going to ask you to do. So Ian, you can stand on stage, drop your trousers for us, and um, do a little Irish jig. <laughs> See, the reason he said yes is because he assumed I'm going to be reasonable. That's what he assumed I would be. Just like if your customer said thank you to you and you asked for a small favor back, they would assume you're going to be reasonable. Now, I'm going to play this conversation out. I need to give you the rest of the words. We're going to move pretty quick. You're going to want this word for word because word for word makes all the difference because sometimes just a subtle change can make every piece of difference that you need it to be. You're going to need to play the other side of this conversation. I think you'll be able to figure out your lines. Be ready when you're ready. There's a couple of things coming. So I say you can do me a small favor. You say yes. Now I say, you wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person. Note these words, you wouldn't happen to know. Why would I say you wouldn't happen to know as opposed to do you know? What's the difference? See, if I throw down a challenge and assume you don't know something, what does it make you want to do? Prove, yeah. prove me wrong. So I say you wouldn't happen to know. It creates internal motivation into you to prove me wrong. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person. Why do I ask for one person as opposed to lots? Specific, it's less pressure, it focuses the mind. It's reasonable. If I want multiple referrals from somebody, where does it start? It starts with one. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, someone who just like you. Why would I say someone who just like you? What does just like you do? Subtle compliment plus provides a filter in your memory bank. Now you're searching in your memory with less people. You've got to find it easy to be able to find somebody. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, somebody who just like you would benefit from. Here is the only part of the script that changes. All I'm going to do is give you back the thing I know you like the taste of. What did you thank me for in the business relationship? Make something up. Thank me for what? Helping you lose weight? Yeah. Helping you make money? So how much weight did you lose on your C9? Uh, five pounds. Okay. You wouldn't happen to know maybe just one person, somebody who just like you, would benefit from being able to find that extra notch on the belt loop? They would. Right? So I'm just going to give him back the thing that I know he likes to taste of. He says, I would, and then I'm going to shut up. How's the silence going to make him feel? So how does he break the silence? He talks, right? What's the only thing he can talk about? The person he knows. Now here's the real magic, though, is I'm going to see when he's thought of somebody. No, I said I'm going to see when he's thought of somebody. Because his body language will change. His physiology will physically move. He will come in, he'll come out, he'll cross, he'll uncross, he'll scratch his face, he'll do something peculiar. And at that point, I'll know he's thinking of somebody. But he's not sure whether it will or won't be right. But he's got the person in mind. Here's what I now do. I say the words, don't worry. See, I break the silence because I know it was going to be awkward for you. Don't worry. And your body language changes again. You go... Just a little kind of micro movement, just whoo. Don't worry, I'm not looking for the details right now. But who was it you were thinking of? Sure. 
Note those words. Don't worry, I'm not looking for their details right now. But, who was it you're thinking of? See, I've made it okay for you not to tell me, but obligatory that you tell me. <laughs> See the difference? See, what does the word but do in a sentence? It should be avoided at all costs, because if I said, look, you're a really valuable member of the team here at Forever, we're delighted with everything you've done in your career to date, but what are you interested in? Everything that follows the but, and what did I do wrong? Forget all the good stuff, tell me the bad news. But negates everything that happened prior. Don't worry, I'm not looking for the details right now, but who was it you were thinking of? You say, my son. I say, what's your son's name? Greg. Okay, and when are you next likely to see Greg? And later today. Awesome. Well, when you see your son a little later on, would you mind doing me a further favor? Of course I would, Greg. I mean, he said yes the first time, right? Would you mind having a quick chat with him and tell him about your experience on the journey with us? And see if perhaps he's open-minded to taking a phone call from me to see if we can help him in a similar way to how we helped you. Of course, yeah. And you're going to see him later on tonight? I will, yeah. Well, would it be okay if I drop you a call maybe later on tomorrow to find out how that chat goes? Yeah, super, yeah. Morning or afternoon, when suits you best? Afternoon. And, um, okay, somewhere like maybe 3 p.m.? Yeah, sounds good, yeah. Professional or unprofessional? <laughs> Controlled the conversation. How are you feeling on that? Yeah, fine, yeah. Feeling fine, right? Feeling good. I still got to follow up the phone call though, right? This is weird. Because I pinned it to a time, watch how I can start the phone call differently. I can pick up the phone to Ian tomorrow. I can start the phone call with the words, hi, it's Phil calling for, from forever. I'm just calling as I promised I would. What's the only thing he can say back? Great, Great thanks. No bad way this can go, right? Because it's scheduled. He has to thank me. If he's not there at 3 p.m., who's rude? He is. So he doesn't say thank you when I call. What does he say instead? Which is like thank you, but on steroids in terms of indebtedness. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I control the conversation, I control the outcome. When I get to speak to you, though, I say, look, I know I'm sure you've been busy. I'm guessing you didn't get around to speaking to your son. I didn't get a chance, yeah. Why would I say I'm guessing you didn't? Mm. Making it okay that he didn't means he's going to do one of two things. Feel smug that he did. <laughs> I did. Because I'm a man of my word, aren't you? You're a man of your word. Or... Because you're a man of your word, you're going to feel really bad that you didn't. But I made it okay that you didn't, so you're going to suggest to me how you're going to put it right. I'll talk to him tonight. Yeah. And you're definitely going to talk to him, aren't you? Of course. And you're going to call me back. Yeah. The irony is if you slow the process down, you speed the outcome up. If you gave me your son's name and number at the beginning, what would I have had? A cold. Cold, cold. clunky, ugly phone call for both parties. Mm -hmm. Slow it down, you speed the outcome up. Did you all catch the words word for word? If any of you missed it, then I'll do my utmost to be able to get it to you on a YouTube video or a link or a PDF somewhere along the way. I think I have it on my app, which is a free tool that any of you guys can plug into should you choose to. And if you know somebody who knows my work, they'll point you to where you can find it. Useful? Yeah. If I've got time for two more sets of magic words, would you like them? Yeah. Okay. Do you ever get anybody that's stuck in indecision? Yeah. Doesn't know what to do. They're like quite like it and you're sat in that little scenario where they quite like the idea of maybe joining your business and they're just like, I'm not, so, I'm not sure. And you want to say to them things like, just try it. I mean, what have you got to lose? Go on, just do it. That's what you want to say to them, right? You know when you find yourself wanting to tell somebody what to do, but you can't because it's rude and you want to remain impartial? We have to understand some basic psychology. Nobody wants to tell people what to do, but people want to be told. So know that thing to be true. But do you also find safety in numbers? Did any of you have more confidence in joining this business because you knew that other people had joined this business? Helps, right? We're a little bit like sheep. We like to like flock and follow other people. That's, again, a way we're hardwired as people. Anybody watch the game Lemmings? The Lemmings game. Does anybody remember that? Or am I just showing my age here? This is when they kind of just all walk off the cliff together. People are a little bit like that. You can play into all of that set of psychology by telling people what to do without telling them what to do and giving them safety in numbers by sharing your opinion without calling it your opinion purely by using these two powerful magic words, which are those. Instead of saying what I think you should do is, could you say, look, what most people would do is? It softens and it adds power. When you talk in terms of most people, little voice kicks off in the other person's head. They don't feel any pressure. And then they think, I'm most people. And if most people do this, 
that's what I should do, and they feel empowered to be able to make a decision. Sound easy? Talk in terms of most people. In fact, you're going to be amazed at what you can get people to do. Please don't take this home to your loved ones and use it for some form of malicious set of circumstances. Don't use it to get what you've always wished for and don't save it till Valentine's Day. Go out and use it right now. And if I've got time, I'd love to do one other set of words. Something that I know that causes you an absolute disaster. You know when you get consumers say the words to you, I just need some time to think about it. How do you feel about that? It's the worst, isn't it? The worst. Let's apply some perspective here. You've gone out your way to find somebody who needs some help. Find somebody who needs some help in order to be able to develop the business. They want to be able to make a change in their life. You've sat there and you've listened to them for hours. They've poured out their soul. You've provided this counseling service. And what have you charged them for it? You may have even bought the coffee and felt good about that. After listening to everything, what you then do is you present them with a blueprint, a precise set of circumstances that can change their world for the better. You give them everything they've asked for and some. You tell them how to get involved and it's like no money. Everything is going great. They nod and smile all the way through the appointment. Everything is going beautifully. And at the end of it, they say, I just need some time to think about it. How's that fair? See, you've been in that situation, haven't you? You've been in that situation where somebody said the words, I just need some time to think about it. And in that very moment, you're, you're there like, uh, 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 uh. what is it? Just tell me what it is and I can probably help. Right? That's what you think. It's not what you say though, is it? What you say is things like, it's okay, I'll leave it with you. No pressure. I mean, we won't, we won't I mean, I might hassle you a little bit. But yeah, we're ready when you're ready. Any time, like, no, no, no pressure. And then we tuck our tail between our legs, and then we go back about our merry business. That's what we do. But you want to be able to ask those rude, obnoxious questions. But you can't, because it's rude and obnoxious. What if I can allow you to ask rude and obnoxious questions and turn rude and obnoxious to soft and fluffy? Be cool, right? So you can turn rude and obnoxious to soft and fluffy if you preface a direct question with those words. Customer says, I need some time to think about it. You say, just out of curiosity, what is it specifically you need some time to think about? Zip. Now who needs to answer you? Or you say, just out of curiosity, what needs to happen for you to make a decision over something like this? Zip. Or you can really turn the screw. So just out of curiosity, what's stopping you right now from making a decision over this kind of thing? Zip. This is an example of where he or she who speaks next loses. Please don't let it be you. Please don't go suggesting reasons in advance. Stay quiet. One of two things will happen. Either around 12 seconds goes by, which feels like about three weeks. And they come back with an honest answer. You know, I really like this, but I do need to get my husband involved. I do need to get my wife involved. We need to have a further conversation. I really like it. I've got to wait till the end of the month till payday. I definitely like it. But you get some truth. Because I need some time to think about it isn't truth. That means I'm pushing this decision away from the other day. I'm not saying people need to join. I just think they owe you the truth. This gets you to the truth. But if it isn't 12 seconds, it's something different. 13, 14, 15, 16. This is good news because it means they're searching for an excuse and they cannot find one. So don't be surprised if they go searching for an excuse and cannot find one and they come back and they say, you know what? You're right. There's nothing to think about. There's nothing that I need to worry about. There's nothing that's stopping me. Let's do this. And it's the very fact that you're prepared to ask somebody a question they weren't prepared to ask themselves that when they went looking for an answer, they couldn't find one. It empowered them to make a decision that you truly both knew was right. Here's a second dictionary definition of what a salesperson really is. And this is what I think your job description really is. Is I think, ladies and gents, what you are is professional mind maker-uppers. <laughs> that is your job description. And if you can move from knowing a lot about health and nutrition and a huge amount about how to plan people's businesses and you can take care of people and love and cherish them, plus help people to make their mind up, you'll find huge success in this business. Ladies and gents, I've been Phil Jones. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I wish you every success that you're prepared to work for. Thank you once again.